Hello, everyone. This is Dory Clark. I am here with Newsweek's weekly interview show, Better. And our guest this week is Professor Tony O'Driscoll. Tony is the author of a new book. It's called Everyday Superhero, How You Can Inspire Everyone and Create Real Change at Work. He's also an adjunct professor at Duke University's Fuqua School of Business, as well as its engineering school. He's a research fellow at Duke CE. That stands for Corporate Education. Tony, it's great to have you here. Great to be here, Dory. Happy New Year. Thank you. Happy New Year to you and Happy New Year to everybody who is tuning in from around the world. Please feel free to type your name into the chat box and well, not your name because we can see that actually, but type your location into the chat box and let us know who you are and where you're dialing in from uh, because we'd like to say hello. And we'd also like to take your questions for Tony as the as the day unfolds. Uh, Tony, my first question, Everyday Superhero. This is a, a very cool book. It is also a non-traditional book because it is a business graphic novel mm. and it's, uh, you know, sort of cartoon style uh, teachings about change, change management and how to, how to make things work more effectively at work. Uh, mm. Can you talk a little bit about your decision to do it that way? Because it's kind of cool and non-traditional. So what was behind that, man? Well, I guess you know me, Dory, so it's kind of like I, 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 there's a bit of Scott Peck in me. I like to take the, lo the road less traveled, right? And uh, Martino Selvin, um, who was an editor, kind of said, you know, this is a story about people. Organizations are nothing but people. Um, and instead of it being a dry 12-chapter book with lots of words, maybe we want to think about having a, a graphic or two. I don't mean a framework, but a graphic. Bring it, Make it more human. Uh, she'd just been working with Simon Sinek on a, on a graphic book. And, she's, and so I had a friend who does all my graphics for my presentations. And we work really, really well together. And I said, well, I have this friend. And so we invited Gary in. Gary said, this is a great idea. She said, great. She's very non-traditional, right? So we're taking a fair amount of two years worth of research that I did for Brightline, PMI, on why, why don't strategies get executed? So I did the traditional academic stuff, looked at all the literature, tried to figure it out, put it into a framework, wrote that up as a report. Uh, and, and then the challenge, actually, it took most of co like eight months was to get all the research to fit into a story. So I had to learn all about Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey, which I knew about a little bit, but I didn't really know about narrative and the power narrative. And then the collaboration with Gary, Dory, we, we, we got on Zoom because we were in the middle of COVID and we just went back and forth. And, and, and I have all the recordings of our discussions and I'd sketch something and he'd draw it. But I would, I would say to you, if we took out the laughter it was probably only one hour, but it was 40 hours of kind of Zoom time. We had a ball because it was true co-creation. Gary knew a lot about narrative and graphic, you know, and, and how to build it. I knew the research and, and truly what emerged here, thanks to Martina's guidance, was this, um, this cartoon that you, are, you could read. And the goal was about 75 minutes that you could kind of read the story. Most people who've done it say, I totally know what you're talking about. Even though it's quote unquote a factory floor, it's like, I've, I've had that problem. So that was good. And then, and then in the back, there's kind of, so what do you do about it? What does the research say about how to kind of move from a more kind of bureaucratic hierarchical model to more of an open network to collaborative model? So that's the genesis of that story. That's so interesting. Well, th thank you. And so the, the topic of, of the book, um, Tony, you know, you're, you're dealing with change, which is something that all of us have been facing mm -hmm. um, ad, ad infinitum, ad nauseum uh, since COVID. So talk to us a little bit about some of the teachings in the book. Why, why is this so hard? Mm -hmm. And what do, what do we need to be doing differently? Because I think for so many people, this feels like just, you know, an uphill battle. Um, what, what are we missing here that your book encapsulates? Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a Star Trek fan, and I remember Scotty in Star Trek. I'm probably aging myself here, but uh, he, he always, you know, whenever they were in a big problem and Captain Kirk would call down to the engine room, you know, Scotty would be like, we have to reverse the polarity. You know, we're going to turn on the inversion converters or whatnot. And I think we've, we've got something inverted when we think about change, and I'll do it on two levels. Organizationally, um, I call this the tyranny of the tangible. Alison Reynolds came up with that term, but I, I love it, so I, you know. Theft is the most sincere form of flattery, but I want to give credit where credit's due, right? Um, so the tyranny of the tangible is anytime an organization, I'm sitting here with an organization today, and we literally had this conversation last night, is uh, the, the, you go for the tangible thing. We're going to do a reorg. 
or we're going to implement a new process. So we're going to bring a new technology in. So it's normally a kind of structure process technology kind of action because it's tangible. You can see it. You've hired a company. You're bringing in software. You're rearranging the boxes on the hierarchy uh, because it's tangible. But belief and behavior must come first. People don't resist change we're still around. Dinosaurs aren't. We're very good at adapting. That's, that's the human, that's what we have over every other species on the planet. But what we really resist is being changed. When we have change imposed upon us, and we either don't know why, we don't have the narrative, we don't understand, or we disagree, we understand but we disagree, what you get is malicious compliance. You're kind of like the head nod but nothing happens. So the problem is in execution, right, Dory? So, so even, the, even the best formulated strategy that clearly will add value doesn't happen until it gets executed. Now, the word execution can mean two things in the English language, to do it or to kill it. 70% of the time, the people are killing it. You see what I mean? The, the people of the organization, either because they don't understand the why, the purpose element of it, or they disagree, or they're scared to manage up and say, hey, what you said we want to do isn't working on the ground, or isn't jibing with the culture, or isn't being picked up by the people. So, so the, 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 the middle managers, and I hate that term, I'd rather use the term center leaders, they have the best perspective. They sit between strategy and execution. They sit between culture and people. They kind of they have that 360 degree view. And a lot of times, you know, the strategy emerges from on high. And then when they go to execute, they say, a lot of times if you talk to center leaders, like this is DOA, it's dead on arrival. Either the people won't do it or, it or they got an assumption wrong, but the feedback loop back up is very slow. And I think we need to tighten that up. So number one, tyranny of the tangible, meaning don't lean into structure process technology as much. Think about the behaviors, the beliefs and behaviors you want the organization to adopt. Be more principled in what you want to do. And then let people loose. Unlock their discretionary effort, right? And, and, and let them go for it. So that's, that's the fundamental kind of idea. Then I got into what are the kind of components of how you run a bureaucracy or how you run a hierarchy? And then how might we, design thinking question, think differently, if you will, uh, about a new model for leadership that reframes leadership uh, in, in a whole new way. Leadership is not a, we think about leadership as a noun, it's a position or a role and it's in a hierarchy. Um, I think actually leadership is a system. It's, it, it, it's, the, it's the sum of the interactions, decisions and actions of, of an organization. That, that's what leadership is. So, so we have to rethink what leadership means. We have to think about leadership as a system and we have to operate in a much more collaborative way moving forward. That's great. I'm Dory Clark. This is Newsweek Weekly interview show Better, and we're here with Professor Tony Od O'Driscoll. You can go to TonyO'Driscoll.com to find out about him. His book, his new book, is Everyday Superhero. And if you're enjoying this conversation, hit the like button and hit the share button, and especially ask your questions to Tony in the chat box, whether it's about change, dealing with, with it, or provoking it in your organization, or about how you can become an everyday superhero. We would love to hear what is on your mind. And we want to say hi to some of the great friends tuning in from around the world. Wade is joining from Houston. We have LinkedIn friends from New York and Portugal. Cheryl is back from Minnesota. Dean's in Greenville, South Carolina. Carolyn is back from Cary, North Carolina. She's your neighbor, Tony. Uh, our mutual friend, Alex, is tuning in from Durham. Hey, Alex. Uh, Diraj is in Atlanta. We have a LinkedIn friend from Seattle, from California. Jesse's in Tennessee. Al Hassan is in London and Mercy is from Nigeria. We love having every single one of you here. Now, Tony, something that you have quoted that I think is interesting. So, you know, everyday superhero, you're also talking about how to inspire everyone. You, in an older interview of yours, hmm. you cited a theme from uh, the internet strategist, Kevin Kelly. And hmm. he said, if the internet has taught, taught us anything to date, it is that we need to get better at believing in the impossible. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about what what that means and why that resonated for you. Yeah, I'm I'm a huge Kevin Kelly fan. I mean, I think for in the technology domain, right? And, and, and I think, I think, I think there's there's in the book I talk about something called the Hue Machine Interface, the Hue Machine Interface, right? And I think a lot of folks we, we're anthropomorphizing AI too much, right? So that that 
that quote was from, from Kevin talking about like what's going to happen in the future. He's great at seeing around corners for technology. And um, let me just explain it through, through uh, how AI, you know, how Google beat Go. So they, they used this algorithm called uh, AlphaGo. And AlphaGo was a, was a machine learning algorithm. It learned the game Go, which is way more complex than chess. You know, IBM Deep Blue beat Guy Kasparov many, many years ago, but this was a real, real big challenge. And what happened was the, 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 the technology played itself for, I want to say it was 25 minutes. It literally just ran through an infinite cycle, and then it played the master. Now, here's the interesting thing. Go has been played for 2,500 years, Dory. 2,500 years, right? Um, the third move, the second or third move that the computer made had never been fathomed by a human before. So what I mean by machine intelligence is there's a different, there's a different algorithm running than what we have, but it comes up with something different, right? So now um, what Kevin is saying is we need to marry that machine intelligence that is not ours with ours and then anything can become possible. And the most important thing there is a, a head nod to Martin Reeves here is we need to allow the machines to do what they do from a productivity perspective, that's clear. But now what we need to recognize is that there's a machine intelligence that's different than our intelligence, but it still can't imagine. So we can, we can now let the humans imagine what's possible and let the machine help us make that possible. So, so that's where I come down on kind of AI and human. At the end of the day, human ingenuity uh, is something that's gonna be very hard for us to replicate. It, it, it will come at some point in time, but I still think there's time there. But I still feel that we in organizations are, are kind of not, not giving technology its due in terms of doing more than it currently does to allow us to bring our unique and differentiated talents to play. You know, in the future, I truly do believe, I was just actually in a session with Ram Charan and he was talking about this is, um, talent is the differentiator, but the real differentiator is unlocking that talent around something that people have true passion for. I mean, you're an example of this, right? You clearly are doing what you love. Like you just perma smile, right? Perma grin almost. Um, and therefore you, you have the energy to do the work that you do. You know, it's, it's discretionary effort. And I think this discretionary effort is what you will do because you're compelled to, not because you're commanded to. You, you can't not do it because you're, you're curious or you're, whatever it is that drives you. I think that that's a, a level of potential energy that's sitting in dormant in every organization today. And part of what the book is about has how do you unlock that discretionary effort and just get this wave of imagination moving inside organizations, supported now by the next wave of technology that's coming. And I think that's going to be the job of a leadership system, every leader at every level. And to me, I don't define a leader as somebody in the hierarchy. I define a leader as somebody that others are willing to follow. And that's a very different uh, model because some people are not in the hierarchy, but they're definitely followed, if you know what I'm saying. Absolutely. Yes. This is Dory Clark. This is Newsweek's weekly interview show, Better. If you would like to make sure you never miss one of our episodes, you can go to doryclark.com. You can sign up to get a free self-assessment, download that, and you will join the email list and get reminders about events like this, which happen every Thursday at noon Eastern, 9 Pacific, 5 o'clock in London. And if you want to learn more about our illustrious guest, it's Tony O'Driscoll. This is his website, tonyodriscoll.com. His new book is Everyday Superhero. And we want to say hi to some of our great friends tuning in from around the world to join us. Thank you for being here, uh, amazing people. We've got, uh, oh my goodness, we have Marla from Tampa. Mary's here from Pittsburgh. Nancy's in the house from Boston. Alicia's in Berkeley. Patricia's also in Boston. You two should be friends. Madeline is in Germany. Juan Esteban is in Costa Rica. Peter's in Edinburgh. David's in Sao Paulo. We have a LinkedIn friend from California. Kathy is in St. Louis. And Dawit is in uh, Ethiopia. And Alexis is in West Africa. And Layla is from North Africa. Wow, Africa's doing very well here you know, props to your continent for tuning in so effectively. I appreciate it. Aviva's in Israel and Jai is in Delhi. Uh, we love having every single one of you. Some great questions, Tony, have come in great. from our friends in the audience. And Dean wants to know, what is the difference between change and pivoting? And how do you recommend leaders approach each? And can you talk more about the balance between being flexible and adaptable versus consistent and sticking 
to a plan. This is this is the challenge here, right? How do we, how do we know the right thing at the right time? I mean, you know, clearly you need to do both, but how do you get that balance right? Yeah. Fantastic question. So so in this book and and I'm guilty of this, I really did just more argue for one side. So so I believe firmly that every organization today has to run as a what I call it well, this is a John Cotter, I think, coined the term a dual operating system. So there's one operating system that's about maximizing profitability in your current core business. And that works quite well through a hierarchy where you know your customers and you know what you have better predictability on how you're going to grow your core because you've been doing it for a while. The problem is if you when you see a new opportunity as a business, then you seize that opportunity, you create, you know, first mover advantage or some 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 position of advantage. Then your, your focus is first external, trying to see where there's value you can create for the customer. Then once you you validated that value, then you start to look a little bit inward because you want to open your jaws of profitability. You want to grow your top line and you want to you know reduce your costs so you can make a bigger margin. And so the, the kind of energy of the firm starts to look in. You know, we start to look at how do we kind of get the plumbing in gears and cogs and levers moving. And we become absorbed by that. And in being absorbed with that to open the jaws of profitability in our current core business, we kind of get blinders on to seeing where where where's the market shifting, right? So that business should stay as it is. And if you try to do something innovative within that business, it'll get killed because that business's job is not to do that. It's to maximize profitability in this. So the other business is about finding the next profit pool to jump into. And that's far more generative. Productive learning is knowing how to do the things that you currently know how to do. Generative learning is figuring out where we're going next. And that's a contact sport. And that is a diversity sport, diversity of perspective, diversity of opinion. And you kind of, you have to have this melting pot of kind of, because we're figuring it out. The, the, the known core business is the find it out world. So you want to execute the new business is a figure it out world and the idea is who's faster at figuring things out so in that world um you have to think about the organization as a decision factory that's that's kind of throttling idea flow in the other world it's more about efficiency in what you know so the pivots uh, a lot of people talk about hey we need to be fast speed kills you can run over the cliff really really fast you can run over the cliff really really fast so um, agility is different. I'll give you an example. Usain Bolt, world's fastest man. So um, he has a penchant for soccer. Australian professional team hires him after he retires. The theory is he's faster. He's the fastest soccer player. He's faster than Garrett Bale by three miles per hour. So put him on the, put him on the halfway line, kick the ball over, and have Usain run and score a goal. He's faster. That's speed. Well, when he got on the field, if you watch the videos, it's, it's, it's a little sad because he's definitely faster, but he trips over the ball one time. Another time, a defender gets to him and he doesn't know how to pivot. He didn't use the word pivot, but when he was being interviewed afterwards, he's like, I'm very fast, but I don't know how to pivot. And so I think that the, for organizations in the future, the idea is how, how can you maintain speed but change direction as needed without losing momentum, right? And that has to come, I believe, from a customer back set of insights because it's the market that's changing, not from a product forward. So product forward is a bit more efficiency driven, hierarchically led, command and control. But I think the other operating system that many companies are lacking today is this kind of sense and respond type thing where you're running multiple options to try to see which progression path works. Now, once you identify a possible opportunity in the new market, you put it back into the first operating system and then it checks to see, is there a real market there? Can we make money and so on and so forth? So that's how I see those two uh, um, dovetailing. It used to be in the old world, or you know this well, you had exploit companies and explorer companies. Now, you're, you have to do both in a faster cycle if you want to grow. 
Absolutely. We're here with Tony O'Driscoll. You can learn more about him at TonyO'Driscoll.com. His new book is called Everyday Superhero, How You Can Inspire Everyone and Create Real Change at Work. And Tony, some great questions have been coming in from our amazing viewers. And uh, one that I want to highlight here, oh, and I won't highlight it too long because it covers your face, but I will read it. And it is from <laughs> Haley. And Haley says, as a middle manager, I get a seat at the table to strategy calls, but I often find that my input is heard, but rarely taken into consideration for action. How can managers who don't have decision-making power still help create change in their organizations? What are your thoughts, Tony? Uh, I think so. So, so fantastic question again, middle manager, center leader. So, so I, and I've done uh, in prior work, not this book, but I talked a whole lot about this notion of a center leader. Uh, first of all, I feel your pain. Right. It's very difficult. Uh, it, it, there's nothing more frustrating than having a seat at the table, but not being heard. I mean, let's be real about that. Right. And, and I think the irony is that I'm a strategy guy. I've done strategy my whole life. So the, the strategy is formulated in the mahogany offices, right, based on a whole set of assumptions that may or may not be true and are becoming less true each day because the more connected we are, the less predictable things are. That's just how things, you know, we're, we're, the, the, the economy has become a complex adaptive system. So, so predictability has gone down. So that means you need more adaptability, not speed, but adaptability or agility, if you want to call it that. Um, who knows who gets the weak signals sooner as to whether or not our, our uh, intended strategy is going to work or not? That middle manager, I'm going to call it the center leader. So in a way, the hierarchical leadership system needs to use its two ears and shut its one mouth a little bit to listen to the middle management because they will have the first headlights on whether something will or won't work. It, it will or won't work maybe from a market adoption perspective or it will or won't work because the organization itself will execute kill as opposed to execute do. So I feel that, again, if we don't think about leadership as a hierarchy but we think about it as a network, um, Center leaders should have disproportionate uh, uh, perspective brought into the decision-making process. Now, what does that require? It requires that those at the top of the organization today let go. And that's very, very, very difficult, right? I mean, you've, you, you, you've, you've worked your whole, I mean, I'm sitting here with a, a number of these, and they're wrestling with that. It's like the ladder that I climbed to get to where I am uh, it has every proof that this is the right thing. But at the same time, if you ask them, and personally, they're like, but I don't know the answer because it's too complex. So none of us is as smart as all of us. And I really, really do believe, I do not believe that middle managers are dinosaurs. I firmly believe that middle managers are dynamos. You sit between strategy and results. You sit between culture and people. And that's the fulcrum. I see that as like a propeller. The center leader is the fulcrum. The center leader is the fulcrum that pushes the organization forward. It's around that perspective and fulcrum. Unfortunately, John Cotter's research suggests that maybe only two to three percent of, of organizations have kind of got that memo and started to kind of think of leadership as more of a networked system. So hang hang in there, uh, and um, and know that you are a center leader, even if your leadership hasn't quite recognized that yet. Thank you, Tony. We're here with Tony O'Driscoll. He's the author of the new book, Everyday Superhero. We want to say hi to our great friends tuning in from around the world. Hallie is joining us from the lands of the Kitsitanukva in Southern California. Welcome. We have Miriam from Malawi. We've got Sacham joining us. Asamanya is in India. We've got uh, Vusi, who is joining us here. And we have Robin in York, Pennsylvania. Uh, Olu Wafemi from Nigeria, Dieters in Austria. We have a LinkedIn friend from Brazil, Charlie in California, and Bree from Knoxville. We love having all of you. And Tony, a question came in uh, from Tamsin in Boston. And she says, Tony, it seems like there's often a gap between the beliefs that a company wishes it embodies and the beliefs that actually guide what it and its people do. I'm fascinated by that relationship with the beliefs and behavior that underlie change or the resistance to it. So the question, she says, is how have you found it possible for companies to uncover these deeper behaviors that guide what they actually do rather than the ones they wish they did? What do you think? Yeah, fantastic question. Your audience is, uh, is clearly uh, erudite, right? Um, um, this is where all the stuff around purpose, I think, becomes really important. Let me just see if I can preface it this way. 
in a world that's as complex as the one that we operate in today, um, outcome predictability is low and environmental manipulation, like do I push this button or pull this lever, the causality between the two is hard. So you kind of got a double whammy. You're not sure what the outcome might be and you're not exactly sure how to get there even if you knew what it would be. So you got a, you got a double bind there. Um, so you can't really put rules in place. What you need is kind of direction and, prin and principle. So this is kind of purpose and principle. Now, uh, Ranjay Galati has just done a really nice job of kind of synthesizing purpose down. So I'd give a head nod to his, his book on, on purpose. But if it, uh, the companies I've worked with more recently, when I'll give an example, an insurance company, um, we spent two and a half months just identifying what the company's purpose was. And then we spent another seven months testing that purpose with all stakeholders and pressure testing it as to whether or not that had meaning for them. Now, this was a arduous and painful process. Uh, and many times the leadership team was, was almost like, I don't, know if, I don't know if this is going, but the CEO was adamant. You know, he, he let go in this particular instance, and he kind of really said, if this is the purpose that's going to animate and drive us, then the next question is, how, what beliefs must we adopt and what behaviors must we propagate in order for that to happen? Because I think a lot of times we overpromise and underdeliver. Now, some of that might be just because we can't, we don't have the capability to deliver. But I'm talking now about if you truly have an aspiration and you can get alignment around that aspiration from the, from the different, not just from your own organization, but from the stakeholder community you work with, right? And then people, once they get that, that unlocks the discretionary effort. But belief and behavior must come first. I'll give you a very, very candid and simple example. My kid, 17 years old likes the TikTok, right? So I walk into his room after Christmas. I, I, I push the door open. That's a better way to say it. And it's just chaos in there. And I'm like, kid, clean up your room. And he's like, huh? I said, I'll be back, you know, hierarchy. I'll be back in one hour. And if this room is not clean, blah, 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 right? And so I leave. And I walk into my room. Dory, it's a disaster, right? So I'm going, how, why would my kid be motivated to do it? Because what you do speaks far more loudly than what you say. So I think the most important kind of takeaway is in the book is uh, leadership today is about demonstrating change behavior, not demanding change behavior. You know what I mean? And, and so if you can line up the purpose, you can have people who find meaning in that purpose, and then you give them autonomy to go do it however they want to, but you hold them accountable for doing it. So you have Aspiration, alignment, autonomy, and accountability. You get those four, you get the agility you need to move forward. But, it, but the time you must spend to get clarity around connecting to that purpose all through your stakeholder community, that is hard, hard work. That is for sure. And uh, demonstrate, not demand. That's a good mantra yeah. for, for yeah. all of us. We're here with Tony O'Driscoll. I'm Dory Clark. This is Newsweek's weekly interview show, Better. And Tony is the author of Everyday Superhero. That is his new book. The subtitle is How You Can Inspire Everyone and Create Real Change at Work. You can learn more about Tony at TonyO'Driscoll.com. And we have time, Tony, for probably one more question. There's so many great ones that are coming in. Um, but uh, I think this one is, uh, is useful. Uh, Jamie wants to know, how, how do you help administrators who are threatened by sharing information? Sometimes hmm. people feel like, you know, hoarding information is their, is their only source of power. So why, why would they change that behavior if they, if they think that that would, that would cause them harm? What would you advise in such a situation? Because obviously not great for the organization. Yeah, um, unfortunately, and, and look, I'm the most look at the book I just wrote. I'm a huge advocate. I'm a big Charles Handy fan. Organizations are nothing but people. Think about it. If, if, if the human beings in any company today, I don't care if it's a $400 billion company or a $4 company, oh, no, 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 there's a $4 company, a lemonade stand somewhere. If the people walk away, the lemonade stand is empty, right? People literally breathe life into organizations. Now, I'm also a big, a big believer that there are no bad people, just bad behavior, right? And in some instances, there's just not a match, right? You, you might, are you on the bus or <laughs> one, of the, one of the leaders here, he, the way he puts it is, uh, do you wanna be in driving the bus or do you wanna sit in the back watching cartoons? And we want people who are in driving the bus. 
right? You see? And so in some instances, and I think information hoarding is one that's very detrimental in this day and age. Uh, it, 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 if, if people after finding the purpose are not letting go of information, because information is the currency that creates inspiration and innovation, then they got to go. You know, they, they, they would do better somewhere else. Uh, it, Netflix, you, I'm sure you know this, but they, they, have a, they have a very, very solid rule. No brilliant jerks. So much so, Dory, that if a brilliant jerk makes it through the recruiting process, they will say, sorry, and we will pay you three months of severance, but, but we can't accept brilliant jerks in here. And, and one element of being a brilliant jerk is like, I know everything, and I'm either the hoarder of information or, you know, sit and listen to my wisdom. Uh, and like I said before, none of us is as smart as all of us today. And I think if we could put all of our people to work to figure out what comes next, those are the organizations that will succeed. That's predicated on open sharing. That's great. Very empowering. We've been here with Tony O'Driscoll. You can learn more about him at TonyO'Driscoll.com. I'm Dory Clark. This is Newsweek's weekly interview show, Better. Tony's new book is Everyday Superhero. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in this week. We'll be back next week at noon Eastern, 9 Pacific, 5 o'clock in London. Tony, thank you for being here. Dory, pleasure. Looking forward to a great 2023. That's right. Happy 2023, everyone. See you next week.